Welcome everybody to our uh, family learning session for the month of April the 20th. Um, today we have uh, Wesley uh, Ba as uh, our presenter and he's going to share with us some ideas on how to help support our students with their academics and probably he will also touch a little bit of the emotional challenges that we have. So Wesley, um, please, I will uh, stop my video and mute myself. Thank you. All right. Let me back up a page here. So the, the topic today again is to uh, talk about how we can support students with their academic and emotional challenges. And being my position in the school, again, as a, a school psychologist, um, I, don't, um, I don't profess to have any um, teaching expertise. I mean, I have, I have taught before in, in different settings, but not as, a, not as an, in an educational setting. Um, so I'm not a teacher, but I approached this uh, discussion and my preparation as a parent. Um, I have six children and many of them were homeschooled. And so I've gone through a lot of the, um, the situations that we're gonna talk about this evening. Um, I can't promise that anything is gonna be groundbreaking or uh, revolutionary, but it's always a good idea to um, have these types of discussions so that, um, so that we're refreshed and and uh, and know just kind of a reminder to ourselves of of what are are good practices here. So I'm going to start off with uh, some academic uh, ideas on how to help students with academics. And again, I'm approaching this from the standpoint of a parent, but I think that many of these uh, ideas will apply to teachers as well. Teachers that have that role of helping uh, children with their academics. And uh, growing up, I, I read a lot of Calvin and Hobbes. And Calvin is one of those children that seems to have a love for, lear for learning and doing, but he doesn't like to sit. He doesn't like work. He doesn't like school. And I think that a lot of the children that we know and students that we might know uh, kind of also share this, um, this perspective on school. They have a desire to know things, learn things. They have particular interests, um, but they're not always one to really enjoy pen and paper and sitting and listening, those kinds of things. So I think this comic here really exemplifies what a lot of our students go through. Um, the teacher says, you have a question, Calvin? Uh, he says, yes. What assurance do I have that this education is adequately preparing me for the 21st century? Am I getting the skills I'll need to effectively compete in a tough global economy? I want a high paying job when I get out of here. I want opportunity. And Ms. Wormwood says, well, in that case, young man, I suggest you start working harder. What you get out of school depends on what you put into it. Oh, then forget it. I got to chuckle out of that because that's exactly how I, let, I think a lot of our students think. They want, um, they want education, they want to learn, they want skills. Um, they're not always uh, apt to put in the rigor to get it. Um, so we gotta find ways to um, encourage them to keep going with their education, uh, whether it's at home or at school or whether we're parents or teachers. Um, I think a lot of students uh, maybe even some teachers, depending on which grade you're talking about, might have this philosophy or this this thought in their heads. You know, try not to have a good time. This is supposed to be educational, um, and uh, <laughs> I think that's the the rut that we kind of get ourselves into sometimes. Is that when we think of education, we're thinking of sitting and doing and the the mental rigor that it takes, and it does. Um, you know, we don't learn things without practice. Um, but we also need to have some, some give and take there. So 
from uh, a parent perspective, I think it's really important to, you know, when your children come home, especially young children, to give your child the downtime, um, you know, the playing outside, getting together with friends, continuing their talents, letting them pursue some of their interests at home. Um, and then uh, where you can, as a parent, make learning fun, even as a teacher, make learning fun. You know, learning and fun aren't mutually exclusive. They don't have to be separate things. They're supposed to be integrated. It's not always easy to do, but um, those are the times where um, the greatest learning I feel takes place. Uh, I know that um, children and adults remember things better if there's an emotional attachment to that experience. So if we can make learning fun um, or even exciting, those are the things that the child grasps more often than not. Those are the things that are going to stay in their heads a lot longer. Um, as I was putting this project together, I got thinking about um, my, what, uh, what am I showing to my children as an adult? Um, we have to model and teach priorities. You know, children don't always have, um, you know, they don't always have that, that part of their brain um, up to speed or up and running to tell them to, you know, put your, your work first and prioritize your time. So we have to model and teach that time management and encourage our children to have that time management. You put these things first and then you can do these things. It's kind of like in the classroom, you have the, uh, the must do's and then the can do's and you have to complete the must do's first and then you can do the can do's. And I think that's um, what we have to encourage at home. Um, and you know, like I said, like Calvin, he may, you may have a child that loves learning and not like school. So we have to foster a love for learning um, in the classroom and at home too. Um, I felt like this was a daunting presentation for me to put together, but at the same time, I've, I'm going through some of these experiences now where as a parent, I'm getting into that realm quite often where my, um, my children are learning things that, um, that either I didn't grasp well when I went through that class or maybe didn't even learn at all. Um, you know, things like trigonometry and calculus and chemistry, those were not my, those were not my strong suits. I really, really struggled through those, through those classes. And I'm sure that, um, you know, maybe you were one of those parents or you know a parent that has been in similar situations where they feel like they can't help their child or their student because, you know, they weren't good at it themselves or never took that class. So I tried to tailor this conversation to um, come up with ways or things that I've been doing with uh, my oldest daughter who's going through chemistry and trigonometry. Um, even though I don't know the material. So one of the things that I found helpful is to try to learn the content with them. I think it does a lot for a child's emotional state as they're struggling and trying to understand and you know boost their grades and they're worried about the next assignment being um, you know, the thing that just totally crushes their grade. Um, I think that they get us, at least my daughter has seemed to have a sense of, you know, my, my dad's in this with me. He's trying to learn it too. Anything that he um, learns, he'll share with me and we'll learn it together. Um, I think can be um, uh, an emotional support to them. We got to let uh, let them know that that um, that it is a challenge to learn new things, but that it can be done and model for them how to do it. Um, maybe they're not using all of the um, the techniques or the resources available to them to get the job done that you might know about. Um, one thing that I found really interesting and kind of fun to do with uh, with elementary kids, which is where I spend a lot of my time 
is to uh, have the child teach you what they already know and then fill in the gaps. So when a child comes to me and says, I don't know how to do this or whatever, more often than not, they know something or they think they know something. Um, it's, it can do quite a bit, at least to get over that hurdle of starting to work on a problem by having them say, okay, here's what I do know, or here's what I think I know. And then you fill in the gaps and then either learn it with them or, or just fill in those gaps for them. And if you're totally stumped, um, you know, some of the, the core curriculum has been a, a big change for a lot of, of parents that I've spoken to, um, you know, especially the, the math, learning the math a different way was, was a challenge for, for parents. Um, and so it, sometimes it might be important for a parent to ask the teacher what is expected, you know, what's expected on this assignment, what are the goals of um, these assignments that my student is, is trying to do so that we know what the end result is supposed to be and we can kind of guide uh, the, the child towards that goal. Um, and like I said, when we sit down and learn content with our child next to them, they see that we're working to understand what they're struggling with. And that goes a long way. Um, when we're talking about prioritizing or you know, helping our child prioritizing their time, quite often we have to set limits uh, and demand that they get some work done before they go play. They have to learn to prioritize and put the, the big things first. You know, you may have seen the, um, the um, object lesson of, of an empty jar and you have all these rocks that you have to put in the empty jar and try and fi figure out a way to make them all fit. Uh, you realize that if you put the small pebbles in first and then the big ones, it doesn't all fit. Um, you, you still have a lot of rocks left out of the jar, but if you put the large rocks in first and then the smaller things in and kind of shake it around, everything kind of, everything fits in the jar. And I think that's a concept that um, children are reluctant to learn, but one that as teachers and parents, we can lovingly um, show them that they'll get along a lot farther and a lot happier if they put um, first things first in, in their day. What else can we do? Um, encourage uh, your child to talk with an advisor or their teachers about what they don't understand. You know, if, if you as a parent are totally uh, stuck um, or if you're, maybe your schedule doesn't allow for, for things like, like we talked about in the previous slide, encourage them to talk to their advisor, their teachers, and teachers are there to, um, to give of their time. Uh, teachers aren't out to fail your student. Um, um, but some teachers are not the ones that will be, you know, coming at, coming to your child and say, what don't you understand? They, they're are expecting the child to come or the student to come to them and say, here's where I'm stuck. Sometimes we have to encourage the, the child to do that. And sometimes we have to give them the language that they need. They may be reluctant to talk to an advisor or a teacher because they don't know what to say. They don't know how to approach a teacher. So we might have to coach them and, and how to do that. Um, I don't know what kind of times we're in, but I know that, that Zoom and other uh, things of that nature work really well. Uh, we can encourage our student to start or join a study group. Um, those can be really, really effective. And it's really important that we stay informed on our, our children's grades, you know, at the high school level, um, probably at the intermediate level too. Um, we get, you know, progress reports every so often on how our child's doing in each class. And it's important that we stay on top of that and um, cause you know, the child might not be. And so it's, um, kind of, we have that responsibility to, um, not do the work for them and not be a nag about it, but to, to be informed because, um, you know, how a child is doing in school can 
can really affect how they feel about themselves. And grades mean a lot to a lot of students. And so being an informed parent on how they're doing um, can help help a child avoid some of those, those pitfalls later on. As always, we need to be compassionate listeners. When a child's going through an academic struggle, um, it's important to, to, to listen when they wanna talk. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, a little bit later. Uh, one thing that I've really been um, impressed by over the last couple of years that this has kind of been a big deal uh, my daughter, who's a junior, said that her freshman year, um, this was kind of the theme uh, that was floating around the school is this growth versus fixed mindset. And that's something that uh, a growth mindset is something that children can adopt from a very early age um, or that we can mold um, and you know, help the child mold their mind into a growth mindset because um, the opposite uh, the fixed mindset uh, can be really debilitating, um, as we'll see here. I don't know if you can see these um, these visuals that I have up here, and you may have already seen some of this, that a, a fixed mindset um, kind of has the idea that um, it, the child might say to themselves, I'm only good at certain things. Um, um, but I, I can read it. I can read can, it. Oh, okay. Um, they might give up when things are too hard. Um, so we have to foster that growth mindset of perseverance, even when things are difficult, and praise the, the effort, um, not necessarily the, the skill that the child has, but the effort they're putting forward to build new skills. It helps them embrace the challenges, and um, they learn that they, may, they don't have to be good at everything but they have to believe that they can be good at anything. They have that, that potential um, uh, to, and then it takes, sometimes it takes a lot of trying and trying again. Um, I think that's, that's really, um, um, really, really important for, for children to learn early on. It helps them embrace, embrace challenges, try new things, um, use their erasers and um, can really do a lot for their, um, their, their emotional state too. I've seen children that have a very fixed mindset. They're easy to break down when things get remotely difficult. They feel like they see something very daunting that they don't feel they can do. And it's emotionally taxing on them to look at those things and and have that fixed mindset about learning. So that's really important. There's another visual that kind of shows what the different brain believes. You know, there's the fixed mindset that believes that, um, you know, when you're good at something, everything is easy, or that they need to avoid challenges. Whereas a growth mindset looks for challenges because that's where they improve. And, uh, Messing up just means that you have more to learn and that's okay. Again, this may or may not be new information, but I think it fits in the subject matter of our discussion tonight. Continuing a little bit with growth mindset, maybe the child doesn't know about it. So talk to them about growth mindset, what that means, what it looks like, why it's important. Um, if a child is struggling academically, remind them of the things that they've already learned. Um, sometimes when I'm testing a student, uh, they might look at the multiplication that I'm asking them to try. And they're saying, well, I don't know how to do that. or I'm not very good at that. Or I'll never get it or whatever. And you know, they kind of have this, uh, this defeatist language. And I have to remind them sometimes that, well, maybe, you know, when you were learning how to add and subtract, you know, that may have been challenging or look new at that time. And now you know how to do all that stuff. Sometimes children need to be reminded of, of those things that they've already conquered, those, those challenges that they've already overcome. And again, we got to praise effort over skills. 
Um, you don't want the child to believe that um, all skills are innate and that you're just born with the skills that you have and that's all you get. So we've got to praise effort, trying. And uh, I think more importantly, even trying again, not only try, not just trying once, but trying again um, after you have not been completely successful or done as well as you wanted to. Um, I think that's even more, even more important than just trying once. Uh, so looking at emotions now, uh, how can we help students through emotional challenges? Um, I want to start off with uh, things that we need to be aware of, some watch fors. Um, I recently took a course on um, youth emotional health, um, watching for signs of, of suicide, that sort of thing. And that's always uh, important um, uh, as teachers and as parents. So we're going to quickly go over some watch fors that you may or may not uh, be aware of. We got to be on the lookout for danger signs. Um, we don't want to be angry or embarrass our child if we see, you know, a drastic change in personality, failing grades, sleep problems, if they comment about suicide. Um, they're things that we don't want to take lightly, but we don't want to be angry with them for feeling how they're feeling. Uh, we need to uh, validate um, the struggle that they're going through. It's also important that we respect a teenager's privacy, um, unless we suspect that something detrimental is going on in his or her life, because they need to know that we can be trusted, that they are somebody, we are somebody that they can be listened to, and that we trust them as well. Um, what a child watches, hears, does, plays on the internet can have a big impact on how they're feeling. So we need to be aware of those things too. Um, thinking about um, emotional struggles that youth have at any age, um, this was one that prompted me to think about adults that I've had in my life, particularly teachers, um, who did a very good job and it seemed to be really natural about getting the best out of me and fostering that growth mindset, fostering that self-esteem, encouraged me encouraging me to try new things. Um, I thought of those people as I, as I was making this slide. So I want you to think of a time in your life when you needed somebody to be there for you during a difficult time. And think about who it was and why you went to that person. I would imagine that whoever you went to probably showed at least one of these characteristics. And these are characteristics that we um, should foster within ourselves as teachers and as parents. The listening without judging or interrupting. Uh, the, the person you went to may have given advice, but only when it was asked for. And they didn't tell you what to do. You know, if you came to them with a, a problem, you know, the first thing out of their mouth wasn't to say, well, you should do this. Um, they, they probably empathized with you. Uh, they didn't take offense or trivialize your concern. And they didn't turn the conversation into a story about them. They didn't come back and say, yeah, well, when I went through that and this is what happened to me, because that doesn't really help the, the person that is going through the challenge. Um, I can't see what I've written at the bottom, whoops. Uh, Minerva, can you read what that says there at the bottom? I can't seem to get this thing. They let you know that you could approach them anytime. Okay. Yep. Kind of that open door policy that um, I think the best of teachers have. And parents. Sometimes it can be difficult to know what to say. Um, I think as parents, 
it's important that we start the conversation. I would suspect that more often than not, if the child's going through a problem, we might see some, some behaviors that, that um, lend us to believe that something is going on, but that doesn't mean that the child is going to come and talk to us. Um, probably depends a lot on the relationship, but um, I think that's just a, how a lot of kids are, especially teenagers. So I think it's important as, as parents to start the conversation up, tell them what you've been thinking about. Let them know that, that you notice. Um, it's probable that the teenager is, isn't going to be uh, forthcoming right away um, or, or whoever it is. So we have to be okay with a little bit of silence and then be a non-judgmental listener and invite them to say more because we might not get all of those feelings out or all of those words out the first time around. Um, being a non-judgmental listener means, means that we use I statements when we talk to them. Things like, um, I've noticed that um, you seem to be feeling this way, or I noticed that you're doing a lot more of this. Um, I don't yet understand why this is going on those kinds of sentence stems can really foster a, um, a conversation, some back and forth. And then if the child does open up, it's important that we validate their feelings. Let them know that um, maybe what they're feeling is normal, um, that um, what they're feeling is, is okay, and remind them that their feelings change. That was one of the things I remember from working with Head Start is, you know, young children, they get really, really upset with so-and-so or, or about a situation that they weren't first or whatever it is. And we have to remind them that, um, you know, part of their emotional learning and growth is learning that their feelings change. And sometimes we have to remind children of that. With children of all ages, you know, that are going through a challenging emotional time um, one thing that I think can help is helping them develop a plan of action. What can they do or what can you help them do to uh, work through the problem or the situation that is causing these emotions? Um, feelings do change, but that doesn't mean that um, they change because of inaction. They just kind of drift away. Um, sometimes we need to do things to remedy the situation with a peer or with a teacher or whatever it might be. And um, we can be the teacher or the parent that helps them, the child take the reins of their problem and, and develop that plan of action and carry it out so that that problem gets resolved. Um, we might see wild mood swings, depending on the age. Um, and there are some do's and don'ts on this page here. Some responses come with heavy costs. Uh, ignoring uh, a child's mood swings or their emotional state um, can foster attention-seeking behavior. Punishing doesn't really do anything good. Threatening... Uh, breeds rebelliousness and then making light of it just kind of widens that gap between you and the child and and doesn't foster communication in the future. The best response is to communicate, talk with them as you would an adult, you know, those um, those teenagers that you you have or work with. Uh, talk to them as you would an adult and um, get to know what is important for them. Show them your respect and let them know that when they talk, you will listen. Uh, going through this class that I recently finished, I was reminded that the key factor in children who overcome challenges, emotional challenges, particularly, is the presence and involvement of a caring adult in their life. Um, that's the one key feature in children that overcame challenges is they had somebody that genuinely cared about them, listened to them, 
um, had that open door policy and listened not non judgmentally. And I think that we can all be, um, um, and it gives me a lot of pride to think that I'm in a position as a parent and as a, as an educator, that I can be that person for whoever it is that might need me. I find that very empowering. Totally agree. Lastly, I realized that we won't always have all the answers um, as parents or as teachers. Maybe we don't, we won't always know what to say, but we can always be there for whoever it is that um, we recognize is in need of help of, of some shape or form. Um, I took this comic from Calvin and Hobbes. Again, this is the one, the story where Calvin and Hobbes find this raccoon and they try to save it and they take it home and the raccoon dies and Calvin's really broke up about it. And his mom kind of um, helps him come to that realization uh, about, you know, the, the, uh, the reality of death. And he says, mom says death is as natural as birth and it's all part of this life cycle. She says, we don't really understand it, but there are many things we don't understand. And we just have to do the best we can with the knowledge that we have. And I feel like that's kind of how we are as parents and teachers sometimes. We do, we pull out the best tools that we have for the situation. And that's, that's you know, sometimes that's the best we can do. And uh, Calvin says, I guess that makes sense, but don't you go anywhere. And uh, Hobbes is, you know, he's the character that's always there by Calvin's side and somehow helps him through it, even though he's, uh, been anthropomorphized. So just some thoughts there on, um, maybe you're maybe not new thoughts, but at least good reminders of what parents and educators can do for children who are going through academic or emotional struggles. <clears throat> I enjoyed your presentation. Um, I did. And I'm going to stop the recording.